Oh, you're going to paint some of your minis? That's awesome. Great idea. Yeah, you know, I find it relaxing. It's a, it's a good way to blow off some steam and, and get the artistic juices flowing. Yeah, no, I totally hear you. And you have so many minis that you haven't finished painting yet. This is going to be really great. You can finish those off. Yeah. You are going to paint the minis you already own, right? Um. <sighs> you bought more minis, didn't you? What's up everybody? Sorry for the long break between videos. Uh, every now and then I just need to take a break for myself, physically, mentally, to work on other projects, do other things. Um, I'm currently running three D&D campaigns and I'm playing in one, writing a fantasy novel, uh, running another channel for video games, and working full time. So sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to power through some projects and sometimes I just need a break to kind of recharge the artistic part of my brain. But now we're back and we're finally gonna do some artwork again, so thank you for joining me. Um, as you can tell from the intro, I'm gonna try doing some miniature painting on video. Uh, I do feel like I, I paint minis pretty well, uh, but I'm nowhere near these like professional guys that you see who get like all these amazing lighting effects. I would really love to get an airbrush one day because I feel like that would take my minis from like level one up to like level five at least. Um, but you know, for now I'm just using simple paints and I've got kind of crappy brushes, but I do the best that I can. All right, so my poor little kitten Freya, <laughs> I had my glass display case open and I was picking some minis that I was going to show in the video and the poor girl didn't see the glass because it was so clean and ran straight into the glass door of my little display case. Poor girl just crashed into it. She's okay. I checked on her, but scared me a little bit. If you guys have seen my cat in some of my videos before, you know how absolutely adorable and cute she is. So I, I'm like an overprotective cat dad. I freak out when anything happens. But anyway, I'm going to show you some of the minis that I painted. I have like um, hundreds of minis, but I'm just going to show you a few so you kind of get the idea of the style that I like to do. All right, so see if these things are going to focus or not. Um, this is a uh, Silver Dragonborn that I created for the uh, the first 5th edition character that I played. I took some little bits of terrain and painted it to have ice coming up because he is a uh, ice dragonborn. Um, again, I don't know how well this is going to focus up close. That actually looks pretty good. Um, but anyway, yeah, I like that. Um kind of going up in size sometimes I don't like putting any kind of uh like shading or um kind of like with terrain you like to do uh washes um you use kind of contour paints that are more uh watered down to kind of fill in recesses and, and make like a dirt or blood look or whatever it is sometimes I just like doing pure paint no dry brushing no effects just very simple uh colors so something like this barred very bright very colorful um, and simple, simple and easy. Um, this one here is a, can I get that to focus? A Dragonborn that I did recently, a red Dragonborn. Um, I did put some wash on the cape to kind of make it look a little bit dirty, a little bit worn. Um, but a very simple base to it, nothing, nothing too fancy. Um, but when you get bigger into something like a uh, giant, let's say, we get something like this. Um, I spent a lot of time getting the, uh, skin tone that I wanted and I used washes, dry brushes. I painted over with more detail to kind of get the recess to look darker and the outside to look a little bit lighter. Um, use a lot of different color combinations to get this to be exactly what I wanted. I kept the beard very, very bright because I just liked the way that that looked. Um, 
And then, you know, the base, I like the, the kind of icy snow look that I, I was able to make there. Put a lot of wash on the fur parts there to make them look kind of worn and dirty as well. So I really love this mini. And then moving up in size, the most recent one that I did, I purchased a Lord of the Print Ancient Crystal Dragon uh, from a seller on Etsy. Um, now, the pieces didn't fully line up, so I did my best to try to sand them down and to fill in the spaces with glue just to try to, like, seal everything together. And so the wings don't look the best. Um, the crystals on the base, I'm repainting still. They're not, so it's not a finished miniature, but for the most part, I like the way it looks, and it's the biggest one that I've painted by far. Um, so you can kind of see the wings there. There's like a line going across, which isn't the best. Um, it's also very hard to see. I do have like a, a gloss paint over the top. So it does kind of sparkle in real life. It's just kind of hard to see, but, um, yeah, getting the pieces together was tough. I had to use some very strong, quick bonding, crazy glue to get this all to, uh, to fit together. Um, and again, I'm going to be repainting all the crystals here because they just, they look bad. But overall, I had a lot of fun with this one. This is the biggest one that I've done. Uh, and size comparison to my Dragonborn, this little dude. So obviously, when my players are fighting this thing, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a big challenge for them. So I'm really excited. I don't even know exactly which campaign I'm going to throw this into. I have an idea, but I'm not 100% sure yet. So, obviously, I'm not like a professional miniature painter. I'm not as good as some of these amazing people are. I know some of the lighting effects involves really watering down your paint. And um, I just I haven't really tried it. I'm not that great at it. Um, but the two miniatures that I purchased that we're going to be painting in this video are uh, large creatures. Um, I like that every now and then because you don't have to focus on like tiny little belts and leather straps and all the little details. So for those smaller ones, you have to get like really, really close. And so I'm like holding the miniature like right here and I'm painting and I'm just like right in there. How am I going to fit a camera like into my face? And like, it's just not going to work. Um, so I thought, you know, people have told me before, why don't you paint some minis on your channel? And I was like, well, because I'm not that good at it also. It's hard to like film something like that, but I wanted to do it because I do focus a lot on Dungeons and Dragons in this channel, um, and I'm going to be doing a shift towards more terrain than anything else um, moving forward. So I thought, you know what, let's get some bigger miniatures that I can paint easily enough and see the details while still having like a camera looking at it that's not going to get in my way too much. So uh, the two miniatures that we're going to be painting today... One is going to be a Behir, or I think it's Behir. I might be pronouncing it wrong. I don't know. I'm the Dungeon Master, so however I choose to pronounce it, that's the way it's called in my world, okay? And you can see from the back, they have like a, a kind of like a cold, slimy, bluish, purplish type coloration to it. I'm going to try to stick with that. Sometimes I do paint. Uh, miniature is a completely different color. I have a Remoraz, a, an adult Remoraz that I painted with like greens and oranges and purples and blacks instead of the original like blue and orange because I wanted to make this one rather than being like a, a, a cold creature that has fire damage. It's like a, a kind of cave and rockier type uh, version of it, a homebrew version that does like acid and poison damage. So sometimes I change up the coloration, but for these, I'm going to keep them simple. And the second miniature that we're going to be painting and again, I don't, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, is a tomb taper. It's either a tomb taper or a tomb tapper. I, I don't know. I think it's taper. Either way, it's this really cool thing. Um, I'm not, I know exactly where I'm going to be showing this. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful enemy to fight. Uh, there's only one of my campaigns where the players are strong enough to fight this right now. Um, but that's not the one I'm going to be using it for, so i got to wait for my players to get up uh, a little bit tougher of a level, a little higher of a level before I can throw this at them. But I think it's really cool. It's a really simple uh, coloration scheme on this, just a lot of dark shades. I do notice that the top here has like a much darker, and then it fades into light. So I'm really going to try to get like a good fading gradient on that, and then have a lot of dark features and around the mouth on its stomach. I also typically like to, on some of my bases, create like a environment on the base. So for this bay here, because it's going to be in a more um, green location, I'm going to put some grass and some little tufts of grass and, and kind of build terrain on the base. And then we're going to glue it on top when I'm done. So 
without further ado, let's see how this goes and hopefully it doesn't suck. So the Tomb Tappers are really interesting creatures. Um, if you know anything about the Netheries um, or Netheril, uh, they're a really cool ancient society of mages that lived in kind of flying, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to say like um, cities, kind of like flying cities. They're very similar to um, in Critical Role, if you look at the Calamity and kind of the mage cities that lived in the air, it was very similar to that. Um, they were incredibly advanced in their technology and their arcane ability. And uh, the Netherese Arcanists created these creatures, the Tomb Tappers, which they refer to as the Thalud, or the Faceless. Um, these creatures were made to basically seek out uh, magic-using creatures and had a, in, had a very strong hatred towards any non-human magic creatures. Um, they were mostly sent into the Underdark, uh, to fight against Drow, Dwegar, and other uh, magical creatures and beings down there. Uh, if you run into them in D&D campaigns, typically they'll try to find any magic. They're drawn to magical items, and they basically want to take everything that they can find from tombs or from heroes and store them to themselves. They never use magical items, um, but they definitely want to find them and keep them for themselves. Uh, the reason they get the name Tomb Taper is because they do break into tombs, they break into temples, they go into the Underdark and they find these things. Um, they actually communicate in a really cool way by the vibrations off of their skin, which is both creepy and really cool. Um, they typically absorb nutrients like moisture through their skin and through uh, that mouth and their stomach they'll actually take in the minerals from the rock as they dig through the earth and that's how they sustain nutrients, which is really awesome.
All right, so I just wanted to kind of show what this looks like now that it's dried. Um, it's weird because when I first picked it up today without putting a light on it, I thought, oh, man, the wash really didn't leave a lot of the underpainted tones, and it kind of really took over and made everything look really dark. But then once I put this light on, I am beginning to see the dry brushing that is showing through, and that's the whole point of putting light colors underneath a wash so that when the wash dries, you still have those highlights underneath. Um, and you can see here, some of it still shows up on the chest. Is that focusing? Yeah. You got some little bits on the arm there, little bits on the bottom of the, uh, I don't know, you call that a cowl or a head. Little bits, if this will focus. Come on. Okay, there you go. On the shoulder blades there. So um, we it did have the effect. It just, uh, it's a little bit darker than I expected, but that's okay. And then I'm going to probably put a wash on this. I might even use like a bluish kind of contour paint on top of that, or I've got a few different ones that I that I like. Um, I might use this uh, Reekland Flesh Shade. I might even use uh, this dark crimson one. I think the crimson one might actually be better um, to give like this whole bloody red iron kind of look. Uh, I tried to flick red paint on here to make it look like blood splatter, and let's see if that'll let's see if I can get this to focus so it shows up. You see, there there are some splatter marks but they're not really uh, it's not really focusing that well um they're hard to tell tiny little details but i wanted blood splatter with like a little edge on there where it impacted something um i really like the kind of horror look of of minis if you're making a dark mini from like a dark scary area make it dark make it scary like you know go big or go home kind of thing so that's what we're going to do to finish this up and then we're going to move on to our bay here and finish up that paint job As for our second creature that we're painting here, the Bahir, um, they're very similar to the Tomb Tappers in the sense that they were created by other creatures to hunt down their enemies. Uh, if you know anything about D&D lore, doesn't matter what edition you're looking into, you'll know that one of the oldest conflicts of factions was between giants and dragons. In fact, most of us DMs who like to create our own histories or mythologies for our worlds typically do borrow from that because it is such a well-known 
uh, sort of a background fact for almost all D&D that fits into multiple settings. Um, and in the, these early conflicts between giants and dragons, uh, the storm giants, which are believed to be the largest and most powerful of all the giants, uh, created these creatures to hunt down dragons. That's why Bayhears have a lightning breath attack, because they were created by storm giants. So typically what would happen is uh, the Bayhears would set up a... Uh, uh, what do you, whatever you want to call it, they would set up a lair um, in an area that would be easily accessible for them, but not easy for just about any other creature to get to. And if a dragon um, would make its nest within a certain number of miles of the bay here, the bay here would then hunt down the dragon and kill it. Um, only if they realized that, you know what, this dragon's too powerful for me, they would then relocate miles away until they're in an area of safety, and then again, if any dragons nested near them, they would hunt that dragon down and kill it. So, the fact that they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with certain age levels of dragons should tell you how powerful Bayhears are, and how strong they're meant to be. <laughs> everybody so we finished painting our two larger miniatures um, these weren't very detailed miniatures obviously when you when you're painting larger things you don't really have to focus on uh, too many you know fine points or details so they weren't really all that complicated in the end I am very happy with how they turned out though um, definitely since I kind of softened and blended the colors on the Bahir um, I thought it would just turn it a lot better than having really bright colors that didn't seem to fit um so again very simple paint job on this uh i really like the base it'll get the job done and then for our tomb taper tapper however it's pronounced because i still haven't figured that out um a lot of the layering i did like it's it's very hard to see the uh the dry brushing or like the purple on the chest until you uh really put it under a light when it's in the dark it's nearly impossible to see um but again it's going to get the job done as well very simple miniature with not a whole lot of parts on it that needed painting or different colors. So both of these were fairly similar. Um, I did paint up another miniature, a tiefling, that I'm going to then show in part two of this video. Uh, it was too long to kind of do everything in one video. So part one is completed 
and immediately I'm going to be posting part two as well so you guys can carry on to that video where I'll show you the painting of a tiefling rogue. I'm going to show you how I created some um, kind of like spooky forestry trees which can be used in, in any kind of uh, terrain. Me specifically though, I'm going to use it for uh, the shadow fell when my players go there. So what I do, what I'm going to do is show you a setup for terrain for the bay here, and I'm going to show you a setup for the shadow fell where uh, this guy or possibly some other enemies that would belong in the shadow fell will appear. So continue on to the next video to see the tiefling, to see the spooky trees, and then I'll show you the final setups of terrain that I'm going to introduce my players into for each one.